Hi, everyone. After a long break, uh, I have Danny Bedrosian back. Danny, welcome. Thank you, Tigran. Thank you for having me. Hey, uh, so we're together and we're not talking about the regular stuff that we tend to talk about, which is related to Armenia, but we're talking about this amazing new book that you wrote. And it's it's been a long time coming. I think when we spoke, you mentioned it, I think even on one of our podcasts, but um, it's out. It's almost out or it's out now. What's the book? Tell us about the book. So the book is the authorized P-Funk song reference, the official canon of Parliament Funkadelic, 1956 to 2023. Um, it is a reference book basically detailing the song by song personnel stats of all the music that can be considered part of the canon of P-Funk throughout its 68 year history and i've been working on it probably about 30 years i have a copy here um and the the pre-sales just came in so it's really nice volume really proud of how it came out and uh 504 pages the original manuscript was somewhere around 1700 pages and they did a column style the publisher decided on like a columnized style in order to break it up into less pages than what the original manuscript was uh which was smart on thinking on their part um but it's basically based on uh primary source interviews with a lot of the most important people in the history of the p-funk including mr george clinton and another maybe 65 or 66 really pivotal band members engineers managers people who were in the sessions uh in question as they happened and um it's really i mean it's 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 really very nerdy you know uh as far as the you know the the history of p-funk the the things that have come out about p-funk in the literary world so far have been more biopic um kind of like you know uh road stories business stories party stories and things pertaining to that this is much more an attempt to academicize P-Funk, so to speak, something that George has been very considerate of and interested in for the past at least decade, decade and a half. And if you look at its massive history, 68 years is no uh, no short period of time as far as bands are concerned. Um, outside of orchestral groups, um, it's the longest running uh, production unit co musical collective in popular music history so it's got this massive history and it is the largest discography of any one musical collective so this um this was a massive feat to attempt and uh i remember just beating myself up especially at the beginning process of this like what am i doing why am i doing <laughs> why am i doing this but it was I guess the historian in me, uh, my interest and in, and my my need to preserve this history, because the the vanguard of the thing is really starting to pass into older age, and we've already lost a number of the most important members. So I was able to really garner and collect um, a number of interviews with the guys that we've already lost during my twenty year tenure, and then get the the interviews I was the aforementioned interviews I was talking about really during the pandemic uh, over the phone, sometimes in person, if it was, if it was doable or on zoom. And, um, and that's how I kind of put the book together. So it's, it's, it's mostly primary sources, which uh, adds a lot of legitimation to it um, from a historical perspective. So it's a really a special, special thing. You mentioned 68 years. It's, it's older than many institutions. It's like an institution itself. It's it's amazing that it's been around for so long. It's it's it, you know uh, it it means so much to so many people, including you. You've been with them for twenty years, and and so many people have changed over time. Um, are any of the interviews that you did over the phone or Zoom recorded? So a lot of people ask me that, and I actually didn't record the interviews. And the only reason why is because the I guess I could say minutia of the of the information was just so again kind of nerdy and fact based that it wasn't anywhere near as interesting as say the type of interview that you would conduct 
um, the way that you do the question and answer, the 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 topical. It was really very much like Tigran. Okay, here's the next song. All right, who's on this one, Tigran? Okay, yeah, it's you. Okay, all right, what's this? You know, it was very very kind of cold hard facts, and occasionally people would break into a story, and 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 sometimes I'd let them go into it just because these are my my bandmates and my friends my comrades but a lot of times i'd be like oh we don't we don't need all of that <laughs> this is all this is it's like a giant list essentially and i've been compiling it maybe for 30 years so before i even um attempted to make this a book i was just collecting the information for my own interest i guess for my own self um and had piles and piles of notebooks just filled to the brim with these lists, personnel lists. Sometimes they'd be very personal, like one person's information for each song, like in a notebook, then another one in another notebook. And um, only during the pandemic did I have the wherewithal to be like, okay, I have the time now. If I'm going to make this an actual book, this would be the time, you know? And through the 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 2020 2021 2022 period i was spending 5 to 7 hours every day typing conducting interviews mostly just writing and um and that's where it really reached reached fruition but the um but that's not taking anything away from the interviews i, I did probably i did over 10 documented interviews 10 hours of documented interviews with George, but in total, I probably did about 30 hours of interviews with George. Um, if you include just kind of like pre before I was typing the book up stuff, I was asking him. And so there's like whole sections in the introduction talking about interviews I conducted beforehand interviews. I did for the book, people I talked to for the various pieces of information uh, pertained within the book so it was I think somewhere around 70 hours total of 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 interviews conducted specifically for the book but the amount of hours of question question giving um, over the years is probably hundreds of hours if not more so it's you know when we spoke from what I remember when you talked about this book in the past you said that you know on albums maybe or on various publications there have been misprints or or not even misprints just things that are not correctly attributed to certain artists uh who have played uh you know if you were just throw out a number how many do you think you know mistakes have there been over the years on albums and publications and stuff you know is it is it is it over 100 you think i'm, I'm assuming it is based on the history oh, this organization has this group definitely has. yeah definitely i would say well over probably because yeah. it's the types of mistakes um, that exist. First, there's the sort of accidental mistakes. The The majority of albums that came out in the, I guess we can call it the vinyl era, when albums were coming out specifically on vinyl in the 70s, early 80s, um, the way they would do it most of the time, almost always, you know, 90% of the time, was they would list the personnel, but not song by song. So you would have um, violinists and would list a bunch of violinists. But you don't know who played violin on the first song or you don't know who which one was on which song. You just had to either guess or if you were really good at stylistic identification, you might have the wherewithal to be able to say, oh, this is this is this person on this one. And there was a you know a lot of that for a lot of us uh, P-Funk musicologists over the years trying to ascertain that information. But a lot of times we would be we'd fall flat and be wrong sometimes too. Um, that was the first type of mistake. The second type of mistake would be the mislabeling. So then over the years, as we go into the late eighties, early nineties and liner notes get better or they get more specific per song uh, with the advent of the CD liner notes get larger and they have information pertaining to each particular song. However, this creates a new series of problems because if the information is uh, compilation based or historical archive based, then you have people going in 20, 30, 40 years after the fact and trying to do this guesswork 
and apply it to these liner notes. There might be a deadline for the album release or whatever. So you have these acts, these sort of a different kind of accidental mistake based on sheer guesswork. Then the third kind of mistake or problem you would have, and this is really crazy, is some compilations, there would be people who would put the wrong information on purpose. And it was usually um, due to legalistic procedures. Sometimes somebody would be mad at somebody else and they would leave a name out on purpose um, in fighting. Um, and usually that doesn't have to do with the core album so much, but because I was doing such a deep dive and I was going through all the side projects and spinoff groups and solo projects, the, the politics re reflecting around that was so much greater than just within the core groups. So then you have those type of mistakes. Um, it even in, uh, affected me as a member of the band when um, several live imports came out in the mid to late 2000s and i was all excited i get it from the store pick it up oh this is great it's a live album we did in in basel switzerland open up the liner notes to find that not only have i been miscredited and listed as somebody else but that the whole band is from a different roster as if somebody had just found the rider from another year and just copied and pasted it onto this thing it, especially um, embarrassing when some of these releases are DVD releases. So you can actually see my face <laughs> and see me playing and it's listed as somebody else who's obviously not me. So um, there were many reasons for writing this book. I mean, the, that personal reason was probably the last of them. You know, I really cared about my um, my brothers and my 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 bandmates and brothers and sisters in the band getting their just due because in a lot of cases they just didn't for so long some cases 40 50 60 years or more and and you know like i said before the historical reason the the concept of time passing um and because things had been done so erroneously over the years and then also on a tertiary level for the fans who had spent countless hours pouring over this information with magnifying glass and trying to understand who is on what. And and like I've said probably to you before, there's about a hundred or so groups on Facebook, for instance, that are dedicated to basically hashing out the details of who played on what, you know? So, uh, so deeply that a lot of the hardcore fans have been throwing around words like Bible with reference to my book. Um, and showing pictures of it, them holding it up like this is the most important book I've ever bought, you know, and stuff. So it's really humbling and, and wonderful honor for me to be able to um, quench that thirst, scratch that particular itch and and answer questions that have been pondered over for decades in a lot of cases. Uh, any surprises to, you know, maybe you didn't expect an artist or a, a musician to be on an album or uh, to even have ever played with the collective or the ensemble and all of a sudden you come across this name or a name was mentioned and you're like wow i didn't even know this person ever played with the group yeah there, there was a lot of there was a lot of cases like that actually uh it just being such a large um ensemble and having so many albums uh it was one of those types of things where um there was one song where uh martha reeves was listed as one of the backup vocalists on the song. And it's this really odd psychedelic song, um, Free Your Mind. And uh, nobody ever really knew that Martha Reeves was on this song. Martha Reeves, the famous Martha and the Vandellas dancing in the street, Motown artist. And P-Funk has a number of cross crossovers with Motown. So you find the Motown house band on a lot of those early recordings from the 60s. But this was a little bit later in the psychedelic period, a few years later in the early 70s. And um more associated with the kind of hippie era and just unexpected for that to have been her and people would be like have already said to me wow martha reeves you know and the only people who would have known that are the people who were at the session and maybe one or two musicologists maybe so as the people who are on those sessions become fewer and fewer that are alive that information just goes by the wayside and so i'm super proud to have been able to bring that information to light because yeah there were many cases where where people that 
either it was someone I didn't expect to be like just whoever the person was, was who I didn't expect to be on that instrument or in that song. Or like you said, it was somebody that was like kind of famous that were like, oh, I didn't even know they were on that record. That's really crazy. So yeah, there was tons of surprises for me in my, in my uh, deep dives and digging and wormholes, rabbit holes of, of, of uh, searching for this knowledge and, and finding stuff out found Bob Dylan on this one album uh, by Gary Mudbone Cooper, who was one of the great uh, backup singers with the band, but he also played drums on a lot of the records. Uh, Bob Dylan on one of his records, didn't know that. There's a Parliament song that was unreleased for like 20 years, but then came out on a later compilation that had James Brown on it. I didn't know that. So there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of these cases. And um, probably what's even more interesting are like the things that, people don't know that George wrote, like he wrote songs for the Jackson five. He wrote songs for Diana Ross and the Supremes. And a lot of that information, I guess a little bit more well-known, but your average music listener and even your average P-Funk fan doesn't necessarily know that stuff. So um, yeah, yeah. Lots of, lots of discoveries, historical discoveries. What do you think is the main ingredient or ingredients that have kept this collective, this group together, and, and and how can others learn from this? Because it's so great to have truly an institution. I mean, it's amazing that it's been around for 68 years. What, what, what do you think just keeps it together? Well, I think there's a few things. You know, a lot of people like to point to that organized chaos aesthetic. Um, I I tend to look at the organized part more than the chaos part as being important only because I think your average listener appropriates the chaos or I shouldn't say appropriate. They, they, they uh, relate the chaos to what they see on stage, for instance, but even that is a well-oiled machine that is very, very organized and runs on an extremely um, tight, concise, uh, aesthetic. So, you know, for instance, George, he tells us, here's the sort of the chaotic part is he'll tell us what the first song is in a set. He'll tell us 30 seconds before we go on what the first song is going to be. Okay. And he might even change his mind before we get up there. And somebody says, no, he changed it. He changed it. And we're like, oh, what is it? What is it? And then for the rest of the show, you just have to read his lips. And the rest of the show, you have to read his lips and see what he's going to say from song to song. There is no set list. I've never played the same set twice with him. So you 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 go to him for that first song and then you watch him for the rest of the show to figure out what it's going to be and communicate that to the other band members. That's that is a chaotic element of it. But even that is extremely organized in that you have these musicians who are able to play vast swaths of music throughout his his catalog. So I, I'd say a big part of it is, you know, without patting ourselves on the back too much, the musicians he's chosen have been extremely formidable and apt and and uh, up to the task of playing his music and knowing how it's played and how to approach Mr. Clinton's show specifically. He himself is very uneasy when he's forced to play with other musicians, even great famous musicians when he's asked to pair on live TV, for instance, or at a, a party or a, sh a private show or something where he's put into these situations, he gets very uneasy if he doesn't have his backbone of people. And because he's always had not exactly the same backbone of people, because of course people come and go, people die and generations come and go, but he's always had a strong sort of bedrock of people that he can rely on even if he doesn't have the full 30 piece that he can rely on in those situations when he's forced to be put into a situation with other musicians again with great musicians it could be great jazz players it could be an orchestra it could be another really famous grammy winning band but working for mr clinton it's like working for james brown or miles davis or any of these guys they're very very specific these guys know exactly what they want. And that's probably an ingredient of it too, of the longevity. Of course, another ingredient of the longevity is 
having the band leader cognizant and alive and well and leading the thing for 68 years that is probably the key ingredient because of course you you come from an orchestral background and and knowing that an orchestra can go on without its leader like the count basie orchestra has has lived on without her son ra um but but to have that person still there is obviously um a, a great sort of um ingredient to the to the fabric of the makeup of the thing and and i would also say that his openness and his interest in new things you know he's been saying for 40 years i like whatever the parents hate whatever the parents hate that's the stuff i go for and that's obviously kept him fresh and 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 moving in in the forward direction and and with that freshness and interest in collecting new people for his band every decade or so that so so that there are really classes of of musicians and singers that have come through this band there are the people who came in the the early 60s the mid 60s the late 60s you have like basically three classes in every decade and that goes so 68 years but you can also talk about eight decades which is almost more impressive than saying 68 years, eight different decades from the fifties to the 2020s, which blows even my mind. I've been with him for 20 years and that blows my mind. because so I've been with him for two of those decades, a quarter, a quarter of this history. But when you think about it that way, and within each decade, there's sort of like the people came at the beginning of that decade, people he brought in the middle and people he brought in at the end and having that revolving door and it's not always brand new people it could be people that were here however many years ago like um we're doing an honorarium for the book at my alma mater at unh and uh i'm using george is coming he's doing it with me and uh my my co-band mates in secret army who are both also in p-funk lige curry and benzel cowan the bassist and drummer from p-funk and i'm also using kevin oliver who's the guitar player who was in the band during the heyday, like 78, 79, 80, 81, but then left and was gone for the whole period of time until 2022, and then just came back with us uh, in 2022, and he's playing guitar again. And so, like, you talk about this kind of revolving door of people coming and going, the sort of stalwart people who are always sort of there, people, new people who come on, old people who leave, who may also come back. So it's a a combination of those things that keep it fresh and interesting. I have a an unbroken 20-year tenure, but that's kind of rare, especially for my generation. The older guys, there's a lot of older guys who have the unbroken tenures, but in my era, there's far fewer of us. So in that 20 years, I've seen 13 different Parliament Funkadelics, you know, with, I mean, there's certain people that would stay on, but I could be watching a video from one year and be like, wow, there's only three of us on that stage that are still in the band from any given year, you know? And 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 it's really crazy. So a lot of that keeps it fresh as well. That's awesome. Um, where can people get the book and um, what's, what's the process? Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, they can get it through my publisher. That's probably the best way for me um it's roman and littlefield that's the publisher yep and uh they can go to www.roman.com and then of course you know uh it's available on amazon barnes and noble books a million all the places where books are sold online and you know we highly recommend that people um recommend it for their public library their local library and their local bookseller as well that's that's amazing. That's a major publisher. I don't know if people know that. Maybe I think most people will, but that's a major publisher. Yeah, thank you. That was that was a an interesting exploration in itself. You know, the I, I had an agent at one point who was saying, you know, writing the book is one thing, but even though you're not done yet, this was like maybe the beginning of 2021. They were like, even though you're not done writing it, start looking for the publisher now because that's going to be the hardest part of this process. And boy, were they right, because um, I looked everywhere I could think. You know, I, I wrote letters, sent emails, uh, utilized my 
my varied contacts and friends of a friend, you know, um, connections and all of those type of things and searched very, very deeply through as many publishers as you could possibly think. And what ended up actually happening was it was just, I was doing an interview much like this. And, and one of the interviewers knew a guy who was, who had a similar book to mine about Prince, a gentleman named Dwayne Tudal, who wrote two books about Prince's discography. It's published by Roman and Littlefield. He hooked me up with Dwayne. I talked to Dwayne a few times. After a few months of talking and, and getting some information, then he hooked me up with Roman and Littlefield. And then I had a meeting with them. They loved what they heard and they signed on. But that's after getting, I mean, maybe 60. Uh, we're sorry, Mr. Bedrosian, but uh, this is a sounds great, but it was either too academic, not academic enough too much music, not, you know, too much references. It was always somewhere in between where a lot of these other publishers were at, but Roman and Littlefield specializes in a lot of books like this and they've been a great publisher. So I'm really honored to have, um, to have landed with them. And, and hopefully it's just the beginning of a, of a publishing relationship. And that's amazing. I mean, you couldn't have picked a better publisher. That's oh, Thank you. Um, anything else you want to add? It's been a pleasure having you. Anything else you want to share before we end? Um, yeah, well, pleasure's all mine, Tigran. Thank you always. Um, and uh, I'm going to be out on the road promoting the book basically all the rest of this year and all of next year. So um, based on uh, uh, when this is released, but the, the day it comes out, uh, November 15th, I am doing the uh, Words and Music NOLA book fair in New Orleans. Um, the, doing a conversation with uh, musicologist Melissa Weber. And that's going to be live in New Orleans at the Andre Kaliu Center for the Performing Arts. Um, on the, uh, it's, the book will be available also at all the P-Funk shows coming up. When people come out and see P-Funk, we're going to be in LA on the 24th and Oakland on the 25th. And then I do the, the th three-day honorarium at the University of New Hampshire that I was talking about. Um, from the 26th to the 29th and then Secret Army goes out at promoting the book will be in Portland, Maine at the Oxbow Brewing on the 29th of November uh, will be uh, in New York City date uh, the venue to be announced uh, November 30th will be in Boston Medford Mass specifically at the porch uh, on December 1st and at Feathered Friend Brewing in Concord, New Hampshire on the 2nd of December and then for the new year, I'm going to be booking a ton of book fairs. But in my town that I live in, in Tallahassee, we're doing another honorarium with George um, at the uh, Word of South book fair at Cascades Park in Tallahassee on April 27th with another sort of curated concert of rare P-Funk gems, songs that we never play live um, in promotion of the book. And we're going to be doing book fairs and um college appearances at places like uh, FSU, FAMU, uh, Berkeley in Boston, and a number of other colleges um, in the near future. So look out for all that stuff coming into the new year. Thanks, Danny. It was a pleasure having you. Hopefully we'll do more. Hopefully we'll talk about other topics that I enjoy speaking with you about because you're just such a, you just have so much knowledge about so many things, including Armenia, which we didn't get to today, but next one we will. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, T-Ron. It's my absolute pleasure. Looking forward to it.